This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. Welcome to A Conversation with History. I'm Harry Chrysler of the Institute of International Studies. Our guest today is Ken Goldberg, who is an artist and professor of engineering at UC Berkeley. Ken, welcome back to our program. Thank you very much, Harry. Uh, you are an artist and an engineer. It's kind of an unusual combination, isn't it? Well, I tend to think of myself as kind of a hybrid. So I, 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 I've always been torn between those two interests, and I've been lucky. Here at Berkeley, they're very tolerant. They let me, uh, let me sort of pursue both of them. And ha what is the interface between these two topics? You, you are a scientist and an artist. How, what is your theory of how the two uh, subjects sort of interface and work together? Well, you know, going back to C.P. Snow in 1959, wrote this essay about the two cultures. And he was really pointing out something that's, that persists today, that I, I'd like to, to refer back to the etymology, that the word science is a Greek word that comes from sinder, which is to cut, and art is a Latin word that comes from ars, which is to join. So it's not surprising that these two fields, these two modes of inquiry are complementary. But interestingly, they, they often don't really connect. And there's a, there's a real misunderstandings between the two. And we see this every day on campuses or in, in culture at large. And it's, it's still true here at Berkeley, although I think Berkeley is, is exemplary for many reasons we can talk about. But in my head, what I find is that what they share is a real interest in creativity and innovation. So in both art and science, if you do something really brilliant, but it's been done before, it's not that interesting. What you have to do is something that's really new. And that, that looking, that instinct about finding something, understanding why it might be new, and then being able to pursue it, those are very similar between the two. But interestingly, the cultures, the personalities, the temperaments are very different. In, in an early uh, exhibit that you did, uh, you wrote an introduction, which I quoted actually in our last interview, but, but I want to go back to it. Uh, you, see, you say, media technology generally facilitates the suspension of disbelief. I am trying to facilitate the resumption of disbelief. You still believe that? Yes, I, at that time I was particularly interested in skepticism and the idea that it's very important to, to, to remain skeptical. And I think that at that time the, the internet was just beginning and we were very interested in how it could rejuvenate a kind of sense of doubt in culture. Now, 10 years later, I think that that is still very, that, that we, we, we do have that sense of doubt. It has had some, to some degree that effect. But I'm still interested in the idea of asking questions, of really trying to probe and continually challenge our assumptions and authorities around us. And, and there, there's a link here because science is about questioning and asking, posing the right question, keep asking the question of your own research and of other people's research. Uh, and, and that's what, uh, that's what art is about too, isn't it? Absolutely. No, interestingly, both of them also have a quality where you often start off in one direction, and if you're open, you'll wind up somewhere very different. That, that you have to be, in a way, you start out with these intentions, whether you're making a film or an art installation or starting on a research project, and two, two years later, you might find yourself, you'll find yourself very, in a very different place. And that's also fascinating to me, how you, you're, you're open to what you learn on the way. Now, as, as an engineer, would you explain to uh, our audience what generally you do? You, you work 
uh, at figuring out ways that robots can be used. That's my oversimplification. <laughs> so, so give give us a kind of insights into your work as an engineer. So my background is in robotics, and in particular, I look at the geometry of robot manipulation. So I'm very interested in, for example, how when you hold a cup, how you should place your fingers so as that the, to make sure that the cup won't fall, won't slip. And I look at that in the context of manufacturing, there's then fixture design, and part feeding, things like that. And I'm also interested in another area called motion planning, which is similar, which is how do you move around and avoid obstacles. And especially, I'm interested in cases where there are restrictions on the motions you can make. For example, a car, you can't just go sideways. So you end up with strange solutions like, the, like parallel parking, which is counterintuitive. We're looking at some things like that applied in the context of surgery right now. And for example, steering needles through the body. So there's a host of number, sorry, there's a host of different problems that are all associated with geometry and motion that I'm very interested in, especially in the context of uncertainty and today more and more in probabilistic models. Mm -hmm. So, so let's, let's talk about these medical uh, applications. I, 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 is the social goal here to increase uh, the efficiency and lower the costs of uh, surgical uh, procedure? Well, yes, partly. One is we're not going to replace human surgeons anytime soon. I'm, I, that's where I'm very skeptical. I don't think we're going to, the surgeons is a very complex, a, a very complex task to perform a surgery. What I think, though, that we can do is assist surgeons by providing some help with some of the subtasks that, are, that provide a kind of tedium for them and essentially take away their attention from the important decisions they need to make in other times. So, for example, there are parts of retraction and resection and suturing that we believe we could train a robot to be able to assist in those subtasks. And we're very interested in, to do this, we have to model the human body, but also we're, the new area that's very exciting right now in robotics is robot learning. And that is what, by observing the motions or the actions of humans, especially human experts, like expert surgeons, we can essentially model what they're doing and then use that to build a control policy for a robot. Mm -hmm. and, and this obviously would have implications for certain type of cancers and the deliveries of, uh, of medicines and so on? Right, so there's, there's two areas I'm interested in. One is on the actual suturing and these kind of subtask motions. Um, we call computer assisted, or robot assisted surgery. And then the other is in inserting treatments whether it's chemotherapies or particularly radiation therapies into targeted tumors, tumors inside the body. So we're looking at the prostate with a group at UCSF. And we've developed something we just got a patent for with Johns Hopkins called steerable needles. And here the idea is that we take advantage of the asymmetry at the tip of a needle. So when you push a needle into a stiff tissue, it, will, it won't go straight. It will curve slightly and follow a circular trajectory. So what we do is we, we use that so that as you push the needle in, it curves. Then you twist it at the base, and it follows a different path. And there you can allow that to go around st sensitive organs, nerve bundles, bones, and come in and reach a desired tumor. So that's, this comes back to the parallel parking. This is almost like parallel parking in 3D. So those are the kind of things we're interested in is the delivery problem. We now know how to image the body much better, but we still are challenged by how do we now deliver the treatments to what we're seeing in those images. And, and how will you map that in the future? Is it by uh, watching doctors do this, hiring doctors as uh, consultants to, to sort of help you understand the terrain and so on? Well, so there, in the two parts, and I should be careful to distinguish, in the first one where we're learning from, ro from, from, we're learning from robots, we're learning from human experts. We're applying techniques that actually my colleague here at Berkeley, Peter Abiel, has pioneered, where he's been using them to fly helicopters 
and do amazing acrobatic stunt maneuvers that only a few humans in the world can do. Robots, use, you, yeah. He's trained robots by watching, by basically using the trajectories and, and the data that comes from human experts to, to infer the trajectories for the robot. We're doing something now, we're working together to apply this to the medical, to surgical subtasks. And so here we're working also with a world-class leading physician from UC Davis, Doug Boyd, and he's helping us to basically teleoperate the robot, we're learning his trajectories, and then we're applying techniques from control theory, like calm and smoothing, to infer what he's doing, that, that in a way that's even more subtle that he can't explain, but he can show us, he can demonstrate what he's doing. In the, in, the, in the delivery problem with the prostate, those are problems where it's not so much about watching what, what surgeons do, although we work closely with them, but there it's pure geometry. We're really trying to understand what are the constraints in the body, how do deformations work, and what are the, de what are the constraints in the, in the needle, and then be able to apply purely algorithmic techniques to find the best path to reach a target. Now, now, the implications of this uh, just sound uh, applicable to whole, whole sorts of areas. Uh, uh, ha hazardous environments like Japan, robots going in to uh, deal with the, the, the situation there, the, the recent uh, pipeline uh, explosions in, uh, in the Bay Area, uh, sort of inspecting pipelines uh, uh, and so on. Am, am I right about that? I mean, it's obviously not your work, but, but that's where this all can go. Well, one of the things, I, I've actually been interested to see where robots would be used in the Fukushima plant. For example, that in Japan is very advanced in robotics. They have lots and lots of, they've poured huge amounts of research funding into that field, and there's a lot of great researchers there. So I've been expecting that we're going to, that we would see robots saving the day to some degree. Mm -hmm. But interestingly, there's been very little reporting on that topic. I suspect that they've sent in robotic f unmanned aerial vehicles to peer down into those structures, and I think they've seen things they don't want to report. Mm -hmm. Let, let's talk about where, where this goes in, in the military realm. You talked about, uh, you talked about uh, uh, watching helicopters and, and, and figuring out how robots might fly them. Now, what immediately comes to mind is the, uh, the use of drones in the Afghan-Pakistan war uh, to avoid the loss of American life. And, and interestingly enough, there's a story in yesterday's LA Times about a, a, a great error made by the American military in taking out a convoy, which they thought was Taliban, mm -hmm. uh, uh, remote controlling the operation from Nevada. And in, in fact, they, they targeted the wrong uh, group because it was women, children, and, and some businessmen heading in a convoy uh, to the city. So, so the question is, uh, uh, do, do engineers, not artists, because we'll talk about that in a minute, but do engineers think about the, the possible negative implications of, of where this technology is taking us? Well, I think they should. It's very important. You're absolutely right. I mean, the robots are, are extremely prone to, to failure. We know this. I mean, that's part of what we, the, makes the field so complex and, and essentially it, it's, it's moved slowly because you can have lots and lots of successes, but you have one or two failures and it could be catastrophic. So we're, we are very aware of this. I think that the, the, the drones, I mean, this is really a long trajectory, if you will, of essentially trying to stay as far away from the enemy as possible. So from the first rock that was thrown to the catapult to, to gunpowder, the, the whole, if you look at all the evolution of, of, of the military, it is trying to keep further and further of a distance between yourself and the, and the danger. And so the drones, I think, are very interesting in that regard because it is a natural evolution. And yes, they make mistakes there, but, but so do manned vehicles, as we know. So I think there's a lot of, of work to be done. I do wonder what, what this world is going to look like later when, the, when both sides have robotic 
techniques, and the, the robots are essentially uh, in conflict and, and in battle. I mean, it would be nice to be able to leave, uh, you know, all of our all of our sons and daughters at home and let the robots, uh, you know, figure out who should who should win on the battlefield. Mm -hmm. Now, in in this uh, role as an artist, uh, that that also for you comes with. Uh, taking uh, the philosophy of all of this into account. And I know you've, you've taught a course here on the Berkeley campus with Hubert, Hubert Dreyfus, trying to think of the implications of, of, of uh, technology uh, for mankind and womankind. Uh, so, so I guess the question is, help us understand what, what telepresence is uh, and, and what, what some of the moral issues are that, that you've been trying to work with in this course. So I have to say one of the great, I have to say one of the great privileges um, is to, uh, being at Berkeley, is an opportunity to, to work with someone like Bert Dreyfus. And since I arrived here 15 years ago, we've had an ongoing friendship and professional relationship. And so we've had the chance to teach two courses. Most recently, it was a course on the philosophy of technology, and I learned immensely from him. One of the, 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 the texts that we studied most closely was Heidegger's question concerning technology. And Dreyfus helped me and the class, as we did a reading of that, of that text, to understand what, what Heidegger was saying was a, was a model. Heidegger said, the, the essence of technology is nothing technological. And what he meant by that was that it's not about the machinery, the robots, the, the, the specific gears, motors, et cetera. That's, if you're just looking at that, you're, you're missing a point. He says, ultimately, it boils down to that, that technology is where, a way of approaching the world, approaching the natural world, that it wants to transform it into something that's more and more available, into resources. So rather than seeing, let's say, a river as, as a primitive wood, as something almost magical, um, and or as a as, as something that has imbued with some kind of natural with its natural beauty and appreciation of all those things, that contemporary society tends to view the river as something that could be harnessed to make power, and when we make power, then it can be used for all kinds of different other purposes. So we're essentially seeing it not as its individuality, but as something general and a nice resource. And then we start seeing a lot of the world that way. And Heidegger was very concerned about that trend, that you, we, were, we were not only making the world more and more efficient, but we were transforming it into this more and more availability for its future potential. And that, that, that he said that the, the most compelling technologies of the future would be those that are most flexible. So in a way, if you think about what this is, this was 50 years ago, the, the, he's right, the technologies that are most exciting are, are the computer, the network, nanotechnology, stem cells, robotics. These are all things that don't just do one thing, but they can do many different things. And that flexibility, that ability to be resources, is something that's very, very compelling. What Heidegger, the next step was that he warned that if, it, if this were carried further, that we would apply this to ourselves. And we would start to see ourselves as resources. And we would seek to make ourselves more and more available. And that, I think, is a prediction of exactly what's happening today with the new technologies of cell phones and social media. So we can't turn them off. We can't, you know, we're, we're constantly being inundated with, with data uh, at, at, some might say, at a certain point at the cost of our humanity, of our family, of our human interaction? Is that, is that the, 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 the possible implication? That's one of the, the fears, right? That we're gonna be uh, overwhelmed, that we feel that we are resources, that we are just gonna make ourselves constantly available. I think there are strategies to, to resist. In fact, my wife and I, Tiffany and I, have been, over the last four weeks, we've been trying to do a Shabbat, to really follow the idea of, of a Sabbath, and to take from sundown Friday night to sundown Saturday, and we turn off the cell phones, and no screens. We drive, but we don't do, we really try to, 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 de to unplug. And the result has been really fascinating. In what sense? 
Well, first of all, the the day seems to be to go four to last four times as long. I mean, it's amazing. I, I I have to say, I was a little skeptical because I'm always behind on email, like everyone. I just it's hard habit to to, to give up. And when we started it, I I thought, oh, this is gonna I'm gonna get so stressed out. But the opposite happens, and. I'll, I'll ask, what time is it? And first of all, we have to look around for a clock because you realize clocks are very rare nowadays. <laughs> Usually look at your phone and mm -hmm. if you don't have that. But then, you know, you typically, it's 10 in the morning and it feels like a day has gone by and then it's 11 and it's two and you just feel like you've suddenly, this, this day goes on and on. Not in a boring way, but actually in a much more rich and satisfying way. And so by Sunday morning, when I wake up and get back in, or Saturday night, you're, you're, you, you just feel incredibly rejuvenated. And I think, I might be wrong, but I think I could do more work on that three-hour Sunday after the rest than I could if I had worked straight through. Mm -hmm. Now, th this raises an interesting question because, and, and we, we've talked about what robots can do and the, the, the possible liabilities weighed against the, the good that they can do. And w one aspect of your work that interests me as an artist is to, to do projects that essentially look at where a culture or subculture is and ask or answer questions. And I have two things in mind here. One is you, you and Tiffany did a, a movie called The Tribe, which uh, is, uh, tries to answer the question, what is Jewish identity in modern times? Mm -hmm. On the other hand, you now have a, a project just opening an exhibit at the Jewish Museum in San Francisco, which is trying to use technology to, to bring out an aspect of Jewish culture, which is to constantly be asking questions. So, so what, what intrigues me here is that you seem to be focused as an artist in, in one aspect of that career in rejuvenating the, the values that, you know, uh, in, in a traditional religion, in your case, uh, offers to, to a particular people. Talk a little about that, because that seems to be a, a, an important trajectory in your life's work. Well, that's, thanks for asking that. And, you know, as we talk about questions, Harry, it's very interesting because that's your, that's what you do. I mean, you are a professional inquirer. Right? <laughs> and asking a good question is a really difficult and complex, subtle thing. I mean, I, I try and teach this in classes. And we have a course called Questioning New Media. And it's one of the hardest things. Students can be, can be very, very good. They can get into the top schools, but learning very well how to answer questions, but not knowing how to ask ask them. And as you know, that's an art that really is, is in some ways more challenging than answering. And I also think that the idea, even the very idea of answering a question is, is we, have to, we have to question that because an answer always presupposes, a, has a singularity to it. But oftentimes there's multiple answers and we have to be ready when we, when we answer to also turn around and ask another question, to be able to, to think about what does that open up, what, what does one question lead to the next question. So in the, in the context for me, it has been an, a, an interesting path for, for me to, to think back about my, my origins and my, my background culturally as being Jewish. Because I grew up in a steel town in Pennsylvania. I was, it was uh, Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, which is called the Christmas City, USA. There were about two Jewish kids in my high school. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it was, it, you know, I, I, my parents took me to synagogue, but it wasn't, a, it w I, we weren't religious or observant. But later, as I, as I started thinking about these ideas later in life, I found their values start to come back to me. And so as you, as you mentioned, the film, The Tribe, that Tiffany and I um, worked on in 2006 was a way of trying to re-explore the, this identity and think about it in sort of what was, our, what was our generation? How were we responding? And we thought about, we used the Barbie doll as a, as a sort of mechanism to talk about pop culture and how Judaism has evolved and that it was very resilient and it had taken many different forms. Um, but at its core, Judaism was all about being an outsider. 
And once you understood that, you started to see how, how it was appealing and how it had developed all these different strategies and forms and multiple answers to lots of questions. Now, in the new project, I'm very interested in, 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 in specifically in questions. And it started with the Jewish Museum coming to, to, my, um, uh, to me and also my collaborator, Gil Gershoni, and saying, we have this arc piece of architecture called the Yud. It was designed by Daniel Liebenskind, and it's really complex. It's a, it's, I call, you know, you've, you, you, people talk about Rubik's Cube. I call this Liebenskind's Cube, mm -hmm. because it's a cubical structure. Within the museum. Within the, the museum, museum, the yeah. top floor. And it is about 60 feet high, about 60 feet long, all white, with no parallel walls. And Liebenskind said, there should be no representational art in this space. That's a big problem for an art museum. And it also, it, so, so the idea is it uh, naturally put sound in there, but it turns out acoustically, it's a nightmare. The sound is constantly bouncing and, for, and acoust we've had professional acousticians in there and they say, this is terrible space. I mean, this is, so what do we do? So we took that as a, as a really, as a challenge and we developed a sound piece that we worked with Meyer Sound these are the guys here in Emeryville who make the best sound systems in the world, Beijing Olympics, Cirque du Soleil. And then we use cameras to, uh, and this is where the robotics comes in, we watch the cameras observe as someone moves in the room and how they move, and then shapes the soundscape to their movements. And the sounds mm -hmm. are, are questions that, have been, that we have culled down from thousands of questions that were asked through social media. We edited those and then we had them recorded and so then we create this soundscape that's all about the asking rhetorical questions. James Baldwin has a quote that we like, the purpose of art is to lay bare the questions that have been hidden by the answers. <laughs> very good, very good. So, so it, then, then what you're, you're doing is you're bringing the technology to an engineering problem, which is this particular structure within the structure, and coming up uh, with uh, an exhibit that in essence helps answer the question, well, what has it meant to be a, a, a part of the Jewish faith on the one hand, and then how is that evolving into the future as we continue to ask questions and ask different questions. Right, so one of the things that you're, you're getting at is what's, you know, how, how is it Jewish? And we, we like the, the, there's a classic joke, which is, you know, the man goes to the rabbi and he says, why is it that Jews always answer a question with a question? And the rabbi says, do we? <laughs> <laughs> and I love it because it's a very interesting you know, glimpse into the idea that the, the rabbi is open to discovering something new about his own tradition, right, from this stranger. And at the same time, it's a welcoming of a question, that a question you know, is an opportunity to, to, to look at something new. He's not, the rabbi is not just expected to turn out answers, but the rabbi is, asked, is expected to take in a question and then think about it and maybe that's, see where that's going to go. And that's a very much of a Talmudic tradition. The four, in, in, when Jewish kids are Jewish, they ask the four questions, which is nice because the Passover holiday is going to be in two weeks. And so this show opens right at the same time, same month. So we're interested in, 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 in its in intersection with Jewish culture. And a lot of the questions that are in the exhibition are come from Jewish sources, literature and, and the Bible and um, Talmud, in the Talmud, but we also want to be very conscious that this is not exclusively Jewish, that this is actually part of many traditions. And so we want to reinvigorate the idea of questions for everyone, that we think it's really important. And you know, the don't ask, don't tell policy, which, uh, which has been fortunately repealed recently in the military is still pervasive in many other areas about economics and about mm -hmm. foreign policy and many different things where you know we're we're told listen this is not don't worry it's too complicated don't don't ask about this but i think we need to be mm -hmm. uh... It, it it could be argued that moving away from these exhibits but to the impact of these technologies generally that that in a way they they can have they have a dual potential 
on the one hand, they can make institutions more legitimate as they ask questions to their constituents about what should we be doing, how we could change. But on the other hand, too much information can, can, uh, can lead to a delegitimation of, of of the institution, and we no longer believe in anything. So, so let's look at some of the work you've done in policy areas, because I know that you've designed a site uh, for the State Department. Uh, tell us what you did there, and what was that about, and 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 what was the goal? Okay, so this started as an exploration of of, of social media. And my students and I were very interested in in a particular sub area called called collaborative filtering or recommendation systems. And if you've used Netflix or Amazon, you know how it recommends a book or a movie to you. So we've been doing some work in that area. And the the connection with robotics is that we do it by using geometric algorithms. So that's why we think of the data in a spatial form, and that allows us to, to develop some algorithms that are faster than the ones that are out there. So we have a patent and several publications. The very recently about well, two years ago, we realized that we could actually use the algorithm that we were working on as to create a visualization for anyone on the internet to be able to see where they stood with respect to other people, not in terms of their geography, where they lived, but in terms of their opinions. And it works like this. You come into a website and you're asked five questions about their, their statements and you're asked to indicate to what degree you you agree or disagree with that each statement and so you move a slider for each one of them and this defines a point in a five-dimensional space and then we use techniques known as dimensionality reduction to project you down into a two-dimensional space and now all of a sudden you can see where you are with respect to everyone else you see first of all that you're not alone that people there's a group of people who agree with you, but more importantly, that not everyone agrees with you. So there's a vast spectrum out there of, of different viewpoints. And then where it gets interesting for us is that you can now express yourself in that context and you answer discussion questions. In the case of the State Department, who we started partnering with shortly after Obama was elected, they asked us to develop a version of this for them that would basically collect input from, from constituents anywhere in the world. So they did not have to be U.S. citizens. Anyone on the internet could come in and express opinions and, and suggest ideas. And Hillary Clinton was very open to this, which is really remarkable. If you think about the State Department, it's a very old institution, and I know you've had many people from, the, from, the, from, from diplomacy and, the, and, and politics uh, you know, in, in conversation. There's a lot of tradition, there's a lot of conventional wisdom, et cetera. But Hillary Clinton was open to saying, let's, let's hear what, what the public has to say about this. So, and of course, if you just throw open the doors and you say everybody can post on my wall and you know, submit, you'll get a lot of very distracting um, comments. And this, by the way, is true for any um, comment list right now. So the New York Times and the Washington Post are struggling with this because every time they post an article, the kind of comments they get can be really disparaging and distracting. Mm -hmm. So they're trying to figure out ways to work with that. So you're, you're biasing or skewing the responses in one direction depending on what the technological base is for taking in the information. Well, yeah, because one of the things is a list is a very bad structure for, for managing uh, large amounts of data, right? It, it, you have to, it's, it's linear, you have to walk down the list. So the example is Zuckerberg from Facebook posted a, something about the new policy on privacy and, and Facebook, and he got 35,000 responses. And it said, you know, you could read them, but who's gonna read 30, you know, we calculated it would take eight mm. days. So <laughs> we're, we're trying to figure out better tools. So this tool is one that, that uses visualization, and you can see everybody who's responded at a glance. But then what it does is it uses social media and the wisdom of crowds because everybody reads and rates each other's comments. And so then we have formulas for basically taking the, the set of ratings and, and, and factoring in spatial distances and, and probabilistic confidences to, to come up with a score for each, each comment. And then its size in the representation, the, the size of the point, grows 
with respect to how, how positive its reputation is. So if you want to see the most popular comments, it's very easy to find them. And, they're, and they're, they're, they're rated not just in terms of how much you agree, in this case, Harry, but also in terms of how insightful the comment is. And that's something we're really interested in, is can we call out the insightful comments? And the characteristic of an insightful comment and in some ways, this comes back to the point you made about, about art and science. What, what, what characterizes an insight is that it's, you may disagree with an insight, but you, you have to say that it's, it, 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 it adds something new to the conversation. That's what insight is. It, it gives you a new sight, a new visual, a new, a new way of looking at a problem. So we're interested in things where you rate something and say, I don't agree, but I do think it's insightful. And those kind of comments really are part of the thing that pushes the conversation forward. So that's what the system is designed to, to look for. And, and importantly, the, the, these differences are mapped uh, on, a, on a screen so that, that you, you presumably can uh, find these insightful ideas in some little corner, but there's an opportunity to explore them and, and see that they're there. Right. So everyone has a chance. One of the things that's very important is, you know, in, in, currently the way the State Department has a blog and it's monitored. And that means that they reject a fair number of the submissions for a variety of reasons and it's hard to know. And so you only see the tip of the iceberg. And this is true, by the way, in the letters to the editor and many other forums mm -hmm. where it's heavily monitored. But we believe it's that the alternative is you let everybody in. So anyone can come in and see even the most minute and disagreeable comment is still in the system. So everyone has a voice, but you also let the, 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 the participants, the community, essentially also rate each other and so that they can, as a group, identify those things that are of most insight, most value. Now, uh, this raises an interesting question about uh, the, the implications of what is involved in all of this, and that is, in this particular case, it's the State Department and a, 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 a leader, Hillary Clinton, who's willing to be open to the uses that this technology uh, uh, could be made of. Uh, but in, in different systems could incorporate technology like this and use it for devious or, you know, uh, not very positive ends. Uh, 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 one could think here of the Egyptian security services, you know, in the Mubarak uh, period. So, 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 how do you, or, or, or does an engineer uh, think about these kinds of implications, or is it only the artist who happens to be an engineer mm -hmm. who worries about this? Well, it's it's it's. I completely agree with your the point you're making, which is that there there are these moral and ethical implications of these technologies. Um, uh, Melvin Kranzberg has a quote: "Technology is neither good, nor bad, nor neutral." And I I, I love it because I think it's it's exactly right. We we have to have our eyes open. And you're right. The technique uh, some of these these techniques might give people a, a false confidence that something is being that allowing them to speak clearly and then ultimately would reveal their identities. And so, um, for example, in the State Department, we go to great lengths to avoid any, um, there's no, nothing identifiable when you log into the system. In fact, even your IP address, all the things that most websites collect and, uh, as a matter of course, we suppress all of that because it's mm -hmm. actually, they've asked us to not collect anything. The reason, now of course that also means that as you have more and more anonymity, it tends to lead toward more and more extreme statements and viewpoints because people aren't bound by their identity. So they'll say, you know, they, they'll, they'll, they'll tend to say things that are really um, uh, contentious and uh, disparaging of others. So that's why the system is, is, is set up to essentially um, diffuse that because what it says is if you want to say something really disparaging, uh, fine. But overall, the wisdom of crowds won't be won't won't reinforce that. So what we're looking for is essentially just it's the principles of democracy. Is how does a group essentially work together and tend to resolve disagreement and so that an extreme position um, that may be very very negative won't be allowed to dominate the discussion. 
But at the same time, I will never claim, and I think anyone who does would be, I would, I would be very suspicious of, I would never claim that any of these technologies are immune from, 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 from abuse. So in, in the worst case, uh, it, 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 the, the, these technologies could be abused by a, uh, an authoritarian regime. But, but on the other hand, these technologies clearly uh, uh, can be used to change systems, revolutions. Here, uh, we, we've just witnessed all these revolutions, uh, ongoing processes of change in the Middle East uh, using Facebook using uh, Twitter. And then uh, the most extreme case, something like WikiLeaks, mm -hmm. uh, which the Obama administration, which supported your project on the one hand, uh, is, is trying uh, to suppress on the other hand the, the WikiLeaks phenomena. So, so I guess the, the interesting question is, how do we navigate these extremes? Great point. I mean, you're, you're absolutely right. The, um, um, the Clinton, Hillary Clinton, and, and Obama, you know, the administration as a whole has been champion of of new technologies like Twitter and social media, and they were caught in a very delicate position by the exposure of the WikiLeaks and the cables. The the the, the sense, the term that they they used is um, that they were they were against radical r radical transparency. And which is where everything is exposed, and I, I think that's a, that's there's something to this point. I, I'm not in favor of radical transparency. I don't think that everything should be done in, in complete in, in, in public. I don't think it's good for creativity. I think that as a as an artist, as a scientist, I need privacy. I need to be able to to go off and make mistakes, and <laughs> try things out, and et cetera. And I, 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 if I, if everything was, if I was living in a glass house where everything was being scrutinized, I, I think it would be hard to continue to try try new things. I think also that in the case of diplomacy, and as, as we know, so many things, there's so many subtleties that have to go on. And I respect that process. That you do need to have a certain um, ability to keep some things private, and yet. I do think that there, at the same time accountability is important. So the idea of openness is, is, is very important, but it's different than transparency, where everything is instantly available. So I think the WikiLeaks played, played a very important, and I think many people in the administration would agree, that it actually played a really important role to make us think about these issues. I think it woke a number of people up that they were not using very, they were not being very smart about the security precautions. Also starting to realize that in this world that it was fairly easy to, to take a disk with a million cables on it and hand it over to somebody. I don't think people quite realized um, that potential. So it did, it had a, a positive benefit. Remember, of course, uh, Assange did not release everything. He was, he was responsible, right? There were some things in there that were too sensitive, and he, he, he did not. And I think that, at the same time, it was, it's a very interesting cautionary tale that we are living in an age where a lot of our, our what we think is going to be private is not. And we have to be, we have to have our eyes open to what that's going to be, and we need, and I, I would say that technologies can actually, may be able to help us in the sense that can they help us to manage all of these sources of information and um, you know we we know now that we can use passwords and encryption and there's certain things that we can actually use to give us degrees of privacy you know, for our for our credit cards and etc so technology has helped in one in one regard and at the same time we also have to know that the there's a doubt there is a dark side that that major companies and governments know far more about us than they did in the past because they have access to our email. Uh, I was at a conference, uh, uh, the, the, the Logan uh, Symposium on Investigative Reporting over the weekend, and uh, uh, freelance journalist Davies from The Guardian was explaining how uh, they, they developed this idea of uh, WikiLeaks working with the press to essentially filter the documents, uh, eliminate names of people whose lives might be threatened and so on. Uh, the reason I raise this is this, that it seems to me that 
part of the, the issues that you're struggling with is to ask yourself in your community what are the values and standards that you will bring to these engineering projects uh, so that we will bring them on board, so to speak, in an environment where we kind of retain uh, whatever uh, moral values, you know, our civilization or our religion or whatever has used in the, uh, uh, the past. Uh, so, so it's kind of uh, intriguing because as we're confronting things like WikiLeaks, the, the revolutions in the Middle East, you know, we, we have to ask, how far do we go with this? You know, do we, do, does it lead to some kind of an anarchy? Talk a little about that because that seems to be uh, implicit in a number of your projects. You're suggesting that as, as an engineer, you think about it, but but you also seem to be in the in this in in some of these uh, installations, uh, trying to figure out you know how you say well my religion or your religion is still important because it it makes us think ethically about uh, the human implications of the technology. Well, you're right. I mean, what you're getting at is there there these. On one hand, what seem to be contradictions, right? That, and I think I, I do think about this when when you ask about being an artist and an engineer. I I don't think of myself as having merged them in any sense. I think of them as kind of as two very different things. It's almost like the gestalt, you know. You you, you see you see the uh, the 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 glass, and then you see, see the two faces. I find in my head when I'm starting to think as an artist, it's a different part of my brain is is activates, and then when I come back to being an engineer, it's it, it flips. Um, but that going back and forth, I find somehow very uh, there's there's something that works for me um, about being able to to do that, and I realize that there's there's contradictions. I like the word um, complementarity. That there, I see them as as not as not opposite, but in some way both two structures, way of looking at two different at the same thing, but from two different perspectives at the same time. And I I find that endlessly interesting is to be able to take some topic and think about it from both of those two perspectives and try and wrestle back and forth between them, trying to understand what's going on. Not that it's going to be resolved. I think that. It's, you know, coming back to our earlier point, one question leads to another. So these two things, there's a dynamic tension. They go back and forth with each other. And I find that that leads to oftentimes some new set of questions that haven't been addressed either from engineering point of view or by artists in the past. And that's when I start to, you know, opens up the possibility of doing something new. But but how does society control this? Uh, uh, and, and I guess here suddenly what comes to my mind is let's look at the problem of the military drones and the extent to which we, we've created a world of video games that uh, teach our uh, uh, young people uh, about uh, the suspending their belief in, in your terms you know, as they play their games then they, they come into a world and they enter the military and you suddenly have people at screens in Nevada ordering, you know, uh, attacks uh, uh, on uh, convoys in uh, Afghanistan. And, and here, the, the, the young people who have become soldiers are well-intentioned. Uh, but they, you know, because of errors in the technology, miscommunication, and, and so on, kind of bad things happen. I guess what I'm curious about is, as an educator, what, what, what do we need to do to get more people mm. uh, weighing these contradictions that, that you've raised, that you think about personally as an engineer, but we're, we're dealing with technologies that you know, will be used by a broad audience that aren't engineers necessarily. Right. Well, I think you know, the, the idea, we, we always, 
when we catch ourselves, I think, saying, you know, this new technology is going to really do some damage to, the, to young people's minds. I mean, you know, I remember being told that by my grandmother, you know, you got to turn off that TV, it's going to rot your mind. You know? and, and, you know, there was a lot of fear that, that the TV was going to have this terrible effect. And we were, you know, and in fact, it was said that when books emerged, that we were going to lose our memory. I mean, to some degree, those things have happened, but we, we've developed new capabilities that, that, were, that were positive as a result. I don't think we'll be able to turn them off. And I think we should really be, as you're suggesting, thoughtful about how they're going to be, how, how they can, what they're going to open up, and what are the new capabilities. I mean, I think that, for example, the ability of, of young students now to multitask is something that I personally cannot quite grasp. It, it seems very, uh, the idea of sitting down or at being at a lecture with your laptop open seems wrong to me. And I can't really do it. I mean, the few times I do it, I get absorbed and I don't really pay attention to the lecture. And, but they seem to have a capability of doing this. And I'm really interested in, in, in trying to understand how, how they do it. How someone can monitor Twitter and tweet during the, during the actual lecture and can be really insightful and share notes among a lot of different people at the same time. Um, it's a new world. And so I'm hopeful. I, at the same time as I think that there are, there, are, there are certainly things that we have to be cautious about, I do think that, that the history of technology has led to many, many breakthroughs and advances and abilities to expand our world and our environments and our horizons. And I also, and it's cured a number of, of, of ailments and, and uh, you know, suffering that have been out there. Um, but it, has it always been good? Absolutely not. But I think it's really interesting to think about these things and, and be able to step back. And I think that's why you know, in a, the, your, your, your program, Conversations with History, is exactly the kind of thing we need, which is we have to be able to look back, not just over the past year or two, but really over hundreds or thousands of years, and understand where have we come from, how have these prior technologies affected our culture. And so that will help us to understand how the current technologies are going to help us in the future. So, so how would you advise students to prepare for the future? Uh, I, I think I hear you saying that, you know, even for engineers, uh, art is important, philosophy may be very important, uh, and and actually, subcultures are very important. You know, the the kind of uh, traditions you come out of, either religion. Or, or, or nationality or so on? Well, I have to be careful. You know, I, I, I think probably 10 years ago, I was much more, um, I had this idea that, that I could, you know, lead the engineers to, to appreciating art. And um, in, in some sense, I've become more realistic. I think that I really understand that there's a deep, really difference in, in, in temperament. And so that, um, there's many engineers who just, uh, it's not for them. And I'm not, I'm not in, in, in favor of uh, forcing it down anyone's throat, whether it's art, philosophy, or on the other side, you know, many people in the humanities don't want to really encounter engineering and its, it's technological um, you know, culture. So I think that part of the, the, what is possible, though, is being at least giving these things the benefit of the doubt. And that's where I do see we, we have work to do. I think that as professors, we can set an example of being open and respectful of the cultures outside of our own. And I mean this, in, for example, how engineers can be careful not to disparage humanists or artists when they're teaching, and vice versa. And I think that's, that's something, for example, here on this campus, we do very well. I think that the, this, these new interdisciplinary centers, like the, 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 the Berkeley Center for New Media, the, the, the Citrus program, these are new initiatives that are bringing people together that previously didn't talk. And I think that there's a huge potential in there. Mm -hmm. And, and what, what, what are the biggest obstacles to, to transcending the, the disciplines uh, and, and reach this broader collaboration. You're, you suggested a moment ago that, in part, it may be a matter of temperament. Uh, 
Yeah. Uh, but but is it uh, also a matter of exposing the other side, whatever that other side is, to to different ways of thinking and different curricula? Yeah, I mean, I think it's ultimately like it's fear, right? I mean, it's it's kind of xenophobia, where you know it may not be about uh, you know another country, but it's about another way of thinking. So. The engineers might have a xenophobia toward an engineer might have a xenophobia toward someone from the English department, and vice versa, right? So th that's where I think it just bringing in a degree of good old-fashioned respect is very important, and I think the culture that's evolved over many years at Berkeley is an example of this. And I, I can't pinpoint where it started. And I certainly don't think it was something that came out in the last 20 or 30 years. It's really been around for a long time. But it was a, it's an idea that when you're sitting down in the faculty club or you're, you're, you come across the campus, you see someone else and there's a presumption that they're doing something interesting. And that's the kind of thing I think we need to, to also convey to our students. Mm -hmm. and, and in the end, it, it's the kind of thing that a public institution like Berkeley with its tradition can do best. Absolutely, and I think this is a, a, this is actually a great point, which is you know so much of the the news has been dominated by the budget cuts and the increases in tuition, and I think for many people outside the campus, they 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 feel you know I've heard people say, boy, how are you managing? How can you survive this situation? It's so terrible, but as you know, actually within the campus, it's remarkable, it's flourishing. I mean, the the environment here is pretty much unchanged um, in so many ways. And so what I think we need to do is to convey that to the public, to show that, that the campus is still this wonderful haven for people to start to communicate at all different levels across disciplines and really think about the future. And that is, a, that is a wonderful, incredibly valuable resource and one worthy of the support of the public. On that note, Ken, I, I want to thank you very much for uh, coming back on our program and for this fascinating discussion. Thank you so much, Harry. It's always a pleasure. And it was great to have you again. And thank you very much for joining us for this conversation with history.